Hello, welcome to the final section in chapter 5 that I'm going to cover because chap uh, section 9 deals with input-output systems, I believe, by both stability, which is something that isn't, it will be tested if you're an engineer, if you go into like systems courses, DSP courses, uh, you know, robotics, stuff like that. But for here, uh, sophomore level DFQ course, um, don't worry about it. So it's going to be up till section eight is where I've seen most professors stop, and that's it. You're good to go. So let's start off with kind of like a like a sales pitch, I guess, right? Like, um, does it bother you that you can't take the inverse Laplace of functions multiplied together in the S domain? Convolution is the answer to your problems, right? Yeah. So uh, basically, convolution is a great tool, great, great, great tool, and you'll see it come up a lot in your future engineering career. But basically, what it means is that the, you're convolving two functions together to get another function. That's all it is. And it's an operator, and it's an integral operator. So let's hone in on right here. And so this h of t is what's known as the function that you get after you convolve f and g together. So f of t convolve with g of t, and this is the symbol people use. It's, a, it's just a star. Um, I know it may look like multiplication, but on on paper, um, if uh, if I'm your TA or something, I would usually be more explicit and do something like that. But for Word, they only have something like this, so just know that that's always convolution. It's defined as the integral from 0 to t, where t is going to be, um, you know, the I guess your domain, uh, f of t minus tau, where tau is a dummy variable, g of tau, d tau. So you're just shifting one function, multiplying it by the function at that shift, d tau. Cool. So uh, a good reason for why we use this symbol is because it's kind of similar to multiplication. f convolved with g is the same with g convolved with f. And then f convolved with g plus h is the same as f convolved with g plus f convolved with h. So it works exactly the same as multiplication, which is good. Great. So, why does this help us? Why is this good? Uh, here's why. If you convolve f and g together, and you ask yourself, okay, what's the Laplace of this thing? It's just the Laplace of f multiplied by the Laplace of g. And that is awesome. That is very, very useful. And so, think convolution in the time domain equates to multiplication in the s domain. And so just always have that in your mind. If you convolve in time, you multiply in the S. Something that's not part of this course, but I can tell you, because I've taken, you know, upper or more advanced coursework, that convolution in the S domain is, it works backwards as well as multiplication in the time domain. Um, so if you had uh, t squared times e to the minus t, obviously you know how to take the Laplace of that, but it's the same thing as the uh, the Laplace of t squared convolved with the Laplace of e to the minus t. Which is kind of interesting. And so, because this is one-to-one -one correspondence, this also works this way. If you have two things, and this is what it's mostly used for, if you have two things being multiplied together in the s domain, if you take that inverse Laplace, it's just those two things in the time domain convolved with each other. And so let's look at an example. Let's see how easily this simplifies your life. So. We have f of t is equal to 0 to t, e to the minus quantity t minus tau, sine of tau, d tau. Okay, first hand, this looks kind of bad, right? If you saw this and you didn't know about convolution, yeah, I, I would feel bad for you, sure. But if you know it, then it's not too bad, because based on the formula, you know that the two functions at play are e to the minus t and sine of t. Therefore, in order to take the Laplace of this, all we have to do is take the Laplace of e to the minus t and then just multiply it by the Laplace of sine of t, which is something that we know how to do very easily. e to the minus t is 1 over s plus 1, right? And then we just multiply it by Laplace of sine of t, which is just 1 over s squared plus 1. And then this yields, again, if you want to combine it, 1 over s squared plus 1, s plus 1. That was super quick, super helpful, all thanks to convolution. Right. Well, and I know what you're thinking. It's because this problem was posed as convolution. How, when are we ever going to get functions like this? Glad you asked. So, to top it all off, the culmination of this course, let's try to solve arbitrary problems. 
we're going to solve stuff that looks like a y double prime plus by prime plus cy is equal to any function g of t y of 0 is equal to y0, y prime of 0 is equal to y1. Again, as always, a, b, c, y0, y1 are all real numbers. Except notice I haven't said anything about g of t. It doesn't matter what g of t is. That is the power of convolution. And this is how computers work. Whenever you're trying to solve whatever equation, to diff eq, whether it be ordinary or partial, um, you're going to use the convolution. And so let me kind of show you what this means. You have to get familiar with something that's known as the transfer function. The transfer function is just going to be what y of s is, or in this case, h of s, big h of s, of the following IVP. So it's all based on, on this. So remember, we're trying to solve this problem, right? But now we're going to start amending it and solve it into parts to then put it all together at the very end, okay? So I'm just going to replace y's with h's for a good reason. And then g of t just becomes direct delta of t at zero. So that's good. And then we have, we change our initial conditions to a homogeneous initial conditions. So we have a h double prime plus b h prime plus c h equals direct delta at zero. And then y zero, y prime zero are all equal to zero. So clearly because this is zero, then this is gonna yield a squared ys, right? This is going to yield plus b s y s, and then this one is going to yield plus c big y s. Then the right hand side, if you remember, is just going to yield 1. So in order to get y of s, oh and really, okay, that's kind of a goof, but it should be h, right? Sorry, I've just been so used to writing big y's. But it is important to write h, um, just because it's, it's traditional. And so big H of s is nothing more than just 1 over a s squared plus b s plus c. And now if you were to take the inverse Laplace of this h of s, you'll get what's known as h of t, little h of t. And this is what's called your impulse response. And that kind of makes sense. Wow, I can't spell. Sorry about that. I'm good at math, not reading or spelling, I guess. Um, wow, and I'm also not good at clicking things. But that's also OK as well. Anyway, impulse response. This should make sense because it's the response that we get from this function, assuming that we have an impulse function on the right hand side. So the word impulse is coming from this direct delta and response just means that this is the solution that we get to this equation. So good. H of t is going to be very important later on. Okay. Free response solves this IVP. So a y c double prime plus b y c prime plus c y c is equal to zero y of 0 is equal to y0, y prime of 0 is equal to y1. So this time we include our initial conditions, except this is called the free response because uh, hopefully we're picking up now that it's free because the right hand side, there's no forcing function. Therefore the function is free to act upon however it seems necessary, right? And I'm using yc because this is very similar to the complementary solution back in chapter four, right? Again, everything is just coming all together now. Similarly, the force response is now, okay, let's look at g of t is on the right-hand side, but, oh, that should have been down here. Yeah, and then we look at the particular, right, because at this time we want to include our forcing function, but our initial conditions are going to be homogenous, they're going to be equal to zero. And so what happens is you don't solve this. You already have h of t, and you just convolve it with your g of t. And that is how you get your particular function, your yp. And so if you recall from chapter 4, y of t is nothing more than yc plus yp. Nothing more than the sum of the free and the forced response. And that's it. So let's top it all off with one final problem. Find the total response for arbitrary f of t. So this is, an, this is a new problem in the sense that we've never seen just an IVP that 
we're not given an exact f of t on the right hand side. But that doesn't mean we can't solve it. We can just express, we can still express the solution in another way, right? So, very first thing to do is transfer function. Okay. So, we're going to translate this to the transfer function IVP, which is h double prime plus 7 h prime plus 10 h is equal to, on the right hand side is direct delta at 0, right? And then it's, we keep our initial conditions, y, 0, or sorry, no we don't, this is a uh, homogeneous, it's the free response that is, uh, we keep our initial conditions. And we want to solve this, right? So what happens now is that because we have this, um, I'll skip a couple steps here. This is s squared, right? Because there's a one in front of the h double prime plus seven s plus ten times big h of s. So it's kind of like your lambdas, except now you have this one over here, and therefore your h of s is equal to one over s squared plus seven s plus ten. And you can factor this, right? So this is s plus 2, s plus 5. Cool. And so if you wanted to find h of t from here, um, obviously this is some partial fractions. And I'll go ahead and just give them to you for the sake of speeding this up. This is going to be minus 1 third, s plus 5, plus positive one-third, s plus two. Cool, then if we take the inverse Laplace of this, this is nothing more than just minus one-third e to the minus five t plus one-third e to the minus two t, and that is h of t. Okay, so at least we have that. Um, write this down on your on your notebook if you're taking notes, or just follow along. Um, because I, I have an X to me, and so we're going to need this later. Obviously, this isn't this doesn't help us in order, well, it doesn't directly help us get the final answer, but it helps us get part of the final answer that we need anyway, so let's keep going. Next step is to find the free response. Okay, so the free response is going to be given as follows. YC double prime plus 7yc prime plus 10yc is equal to 0, then yc at 0 is equal to minus 2, and then yc prime at 0 is going to be equal to 6. All right, those were our initial conditions? Yes, cool. So, you might be asking, okay, do we need to do Laplace? Absolutely not. No, you have all these methods you required, you're pretty much at pinnacle of your differential equations 2552 uh, education and so now use everything that you have in your arsenal to tackle this which in my opinion the easiest thing is to do your lambdas do your lambdas it's fine don't worry about it so this becomes lambda squared plus 7 lambda plus 10 right is equal to 0 therefore lambda is going to equal to we've already solved it out this is lambda plus 2 lambda plus 5 so your lambdas is equal to minus 2 minus 5 and therefore, um, your yc of t is going to be c1 e to the minus 2t plus c2 e to the minus 5t with those initial conditions of yc at 0 is equal to minus 2, yc prime at 0 is equal to 6. And you can solve this all day, right? We've done many of these. You plug in your initial conditions of yc at 0 is going to yield minus 2 which means that is going to be c1 plus c2 and then yc prime at 0 is going to equal 6 which is minus 2 c1 plus well I should say minus minus 5 c2 right and then you can solve this out c1 is equal to minus 2 thirds c2 is equal to minus 4 thirds so those are important Therefore, yc of t is equal to minus 2 thirds e to the minus 2t minus 4 thirds 
e to the minus 5t. Cool. Okay, we're almost there. Next step. Force response. Right? And so from here, the IVP that we're interested in is yp double prime plus 7yp prime plus 10yp is equal to f of t with homogeneous initial conditions. Right? And we said yp is just going to be given as the convolution of h of t and this arbitrary f of t. So remember, and this is written as the integral from 0 to t of h of t minus tau f of tau d tau. Right? So remember what our h of t was. It was minus 1 thirds e to the minus 5t plus 1 third e to the minus 2t. So our yp of t is going to be this integral from 0 to t of this quantity minus 1 third e to the minus 5 t minus tau plus 1 third e to the minus 2 t minus tau times this f of tau d tau. Cool. Therefore, now in order to tie all this up together, your total response, which is what the, the question was asking you for, is equal to your free plus your force responses. So this is going to be, this is going to be, so, and well, it's kind of exactly like chapter four, this is gonna be yc plus yp, right? So your y of t, which is your final answer, is going to equal minus two thirds e to the minus five t minus four thirds e to the minus two t plus that integral. And I'll write it down here, plus integral zero to t one third e to the minus two t minus tau minus one third e to the minus five t minus tau quantity f of tau d tau. And that's how you can solve this for any arbitrary f of t. And you are now done with math 2552 at Georgia Tech. Uh, just a few closing remarks. I really hope this video series will help a lot of you um, in your time here while you're taking this course. I know that a lot of you tend to learn after you've been through recitation, after you've been at lecture, you just want to see again how to do these problems. And so I wanted to provide a resource for you guys that you could take this on the go. And if you, you know, you're about to take a test or a quiz and you're like, oh God, I don't know how to do variation parameters or, oh, I forgot what uh, certain properties about Laplace, you can just whip out the video quickly watch, get a brief summary of what it means to be uh, successful at solving these problems and, you know, triumph while you're in the class. So thank you so much for watching. Um, I hope a lot of you take a lot from this course and believe me, now, you know, about to graduate uh, within a year from this institution, um, I can confidently say this was one of the most instrumental courses in my development as an engineer and really for any STEM major. Uh, you know, I want to go into research and so a lot of it, my research advisors have told me a lot of it is just differential equations. You know, modeling nature and differential equations is very important and so being able to understand the mathematics behind what I'm trying to study is obviously very important and I'm very grateful for what I've been able to learn and I want to keep teaching and want to keep distributing this knowledge to everyone. So thank you so much again. And uh, yeah, I hope you learned everything that you came to learn.